Thank you, and good morning to everybody. Uh, I start with a th thank you. I wish to thank very warmly uh, Luigi, all the other friends here, because this invitation has been very meaningful to me in the sense that is bringing me back to Pisa. Pisa is not my alma mater. My alma mater is Rome. But I came to Pisa as the first place where I got a teaching appointment at the Scuola Normale. Actually, I slept. I went in the men's at the Scuola Normale when still, I think there are no more there, the waiters had white gloves. That were the times. And I lived in that building. So coming back here after so much time is really a personal event. And sorry for having, making this personal remark, but I'm really moved by that. And I thank Luigi and the others very much. And now to the business. It's a really a great, it's really a great, great honor to be here in part of this tribute to Ennio de Giorgi is, uh, in a sense, unexpected and uh, moving to me. I met the Georgi in 55. I say this because, because uh, Louis Nirenberg just told us yesterday that he met the Georgi in 58. So probably I hold the record here in this room, which is remarkable, which is remarkable. I said I met. I wouldn't say I made his knowledge. I probably never knew the Georgie, although we were living in the same building for a while. And I met him in the quality of a student. I was a student in Rome when he was an instructor in Rome. And this was in the early 50s. And in fact, I want to focus on this date, which I put there, is birthday date, which is 1928. So somehow, if you allow me, the organizers allow me in doing that, I will reset the origin of time, not as 20 years after his death, but whatever years are, after his birthday. So we are, I feel in my heart that we are celebrating his birthday. Now, that date, 28, uh, just to, for the younger people, but who knows, maybe not the so young, because the so young, if I make the name of Marlon Brando, or Marilyn Monroe, or Sophia Loren, maybe many in the audience don't know uh, what I'm talking about. But I'm mentioning this name because as popular heroes, they were more or less born in the, the George is younger than Marlon Brando, is younger than Marilyn Monroe, just a couple of years older than Sophia Loren. So this shows how he is with us, because... But the reason why I'm also mentioning that date will come in the next slide, which I named preamble, which means blah, blah, blah. And this is blah, blah, blah about the date, the 20, 1928. What was happening in mathematics in that year when he was born? This paper was published. Now, I'm sure that some in the audience know what this paper is. Incidentally, is in German. At that time, Göttingen was the main center in that. Uh, this paper is particularly interesting because, and is in tune with my, the title of my talk, because uh, this great three mathematicians not only were doing this basic uh, partial differential equations, but they were considering the discretization of this, even of the Brownian motion as the limit of the Markov process. It's a very interesting uh, uh, paper, fundamental paper, which is a bridge 
between what was before Hilbert and so on and what came later. And that's to do with discrete and continuous. But this paper, when such a change of paradigm happens, there's always something important. Now, what in my mind, what really was the, a breakthrough in a change in, 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 in the mathematical and theoretical physics understanding of the world was quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics uh, has very diverse phases, but one is particularly interesting, and is the one that was given to quantum mechanics by Heisenberg. To make the story short, Heisenberg had this idea, not only he, but he translated that in mathematics, that physics is made about observations. Only what we observe is the subject of physics. And what we observed at that time were the lines of the spectrum. And then he realized that to interpret it that was enough to use infinite matrices. So the big jump that Heisenberg did was not to think about partial differential equations, Schrodinger equation, whatever, no. He just said, if I have a convenient infinite matrix, I can explain everything. Oh, that's again we see this transition between matrices, which everybody knows, and infinite matrices. That means to go from the movement of n particles to the movement of infinite particles, that is quantum mechanics. So again here, in that years, there has been this transition between the discrete and the continuous. But then I cannot refrain myself because this will bring me back to Professor Ennio de Giorgi to mention something else that happened more or less in, in that same time and was this very inventive, prospective-minded initiative that this uh, uh, Italian mathematician, Mauro Piccone, did in Napoli, because in Napoli he founded an institute for the application of calculus. Now, this seems trivial now. Uh, I think I'm not wrong, Louis De. Let us leave Russia aside. Uh, I, I cannot cover uh, dates in, in Russia with Loriente, all these people. But certainly, in Europe and America, this was the first institute dedicated to the application, which means computations of analysis, but applied to very concrete daily life problem. This in 27. There was no computer at the time. So in order to do that, Piccone knew I need very bright mathematicians that can do the calculations, because at that time, doing these applications meant some special function. So you, you, you had to be a fantastic mathematician. And in fact, his idea was to call all this younger, better, younger mathematician of the time, and Cacciopoli was one of this, and De Giorgi was part of this, and then Stampacchia was part of that. So this Instituto for Applicazioni del Calcolo, which moved in Rome in 32, I guess, five years later, but was born in Napoli, and the, the Giorgi himself reminded us that he was in Napoli. Uh, I will not talk about that. Uh, is one of the proud of Italian mathematics because since the very beginning, uh, this was seen as mathematics as something useful in daily life, and this is important. And this brings me to the topic that I will touch with you, which is thoughts, remarks about this <coughs> comparison. I use discrete because I want to include finite, say a matrix, but also countable, so an infinite matrices. 
and continuous. Now, what is between the natural numbers, the integers, and the real numbers is quite of a mystery. And the judge reminded us yesterday about that. Uh, but still, and please, I stay completely away of any um, uh, uh, logic uh, consideration. I'm just a practitioner of, of these things. But still, this transition, how the discrete becomes continuous, is very interesting. And I will, the main part of my talk will be in giving you two examples. The first example is uh, we will construct uh, an ODE, uh, uh, Cauchy value problem, initial value problem, and we observe what happens to lines, and this line starts to do crazy things. This, uh, even dimensionally, going behind what is finite perimeters, which essentially means dimension n minus 1. My examples would be in the plane. The second one has to do with some strange dynamics similar to the heat absorption. But we know that heat is absorbed uh, with this exponential decay only at infinite time. You get temperature zero. Now, uh, there, there, there are some other kind of system which have this extraordinary property that reach the equilibrium in a finite time. Uh, we will see. This is uh, really extraordinary. What I want to show with this two example. Everybody in this room is a derivative man, more or less. Everybody of us has done mathematics doing derivatives. The point I have with these two examples is there is something else behind or before derivatives. And when I say there is something else, for this I'm saying two examples. This means there are objects which are so legitimate, I don't use the word exist because I don't want, but are so legitimate as an object of our mathematical attention as it is a circle. The circle you cannot describe in a finite way, but we say the circle, okay, is there. Well, in this example, I will show that there exist things and you cannot describe these things with derivatives. So in my mind, these things deserves to be admitted in the family, not treated as the generate members of, of the families of the uh, derivation people, but must be studied on their own. The second part, try to give an idea of what uh, the general features of this moving from discrete to continuous could be, and is some remarks on, say, a theory. I hope to have time for that. If I don't have time, doesn't mind, because examples, my point, from my point of view, are more interesting than theories. You can do theories, you can play. Examples, a circle is a circle. There is no theory around that, right? So I would be satisfied if I able to convey the two examples to you. But I say from the beginning, what is the point of the second part? We said, maybe there are things that escape derivatives. If things escape derivatives, this means that there is no geometry in, in the usual sense. There is no tangent. We cannot go straight ahead and, and doing derivatives. So geometry is absent from this degenerate member of the family. So what is that remains when geometry collapses? It's fractured, it collapses. Differentiability is not reached. What is that survives? What survives is the spectrum, the vibration, the voice of the object. And this explains why 
I made that reference to quantum mechanics and to Heisenberg. Heisenberg exactly said, OK, there is no geometry in quantum mechanics, but there are eigenvalues, because this is what we observe, the lines of the spectrum. And he said, OK, let us study this. So the process from discrete to continuous is a process that has to follow the voice, the vibration, the spectrum, not the geometry. It's more fundamental, the spectrum. This is the message of the second part, which I hope to have just a few minutes. You said, oh, but this is about the Georgi. <laughs> yes, this is about the Georgi. But if you will see the roots, when you do mathematically these things, you go back to things that were at the very heart of the Georgi. I would say the young de Georgi, uh, because uh, we have seen pictures here, uh, Fabio showed that this picture of the Georgi in 63 seems to, for the moment, seems to, to be the older picture that we have of the Georgi. But in 63, the Georgi was 35. 35, especially at that time, you already were an, uh, an international known mathematician or not. So uh, uh, there is all this period between 28 and 35, which probably should be covered uh, uh, from the biography, the mathematics is well known to everybody, but the biography should probably uh, also focus on this young de Georgi, so to say. And of course, uh, we know that he had done this, the perimeters. Uh, he was a master of, uh, of, this, uh, of this truncation method that he has, has to do essentially with maximum principle. And, uh, Everybody knows what this the Georgi Nash regularity is. Now, at the bottom, at the roots of these uh, uh, questions, of these uh, uh, concepts that he was dealing with, is, are, is there is, we will see, this uh, um, fundamental background that is below uh, derivatives and uh, geometry. So I go to my first example. Now, the example are discrete. So there, there are no derivatives. The derivatives are wonderful. To, to, in one line, you write the Einstein equation. When you work with, the, with, with sequences, you have to write sums. So I, I apologize. It would be a bit ugly to, to, to read and to follow. So what I want to say now here is that we work with a grid. The grid simply could be when we divide uh, uh, the R2 in, in a square grid, putting points and in a mesh that can become smaller and smaller. But uh, my grids will be in space-time. Space-time mean because I'm interested in, in evolution. So uh, is the base is, say, R2, and then we have the time axis from zero to plus infinity, we have the parabolic cylinder. In this parabolic cylinder, we put points. We put points, infinite many points. This is what I call a grid. So this means that we have a discretization of time and a discretization of space. But it's important here to work at the same time in space and time. And in fact, how we can do in the same token how can we discretize space, and now we can discretize time? This was one of the topics of this current Friedrichs, etc., to do the joint scaling. It, it's, I found this nice that you can use a dictionary. So you can use words. This is this set. These words have an N, which is an integer. A K, which goes, this capital K, say, is 24. So 23, no, 24. So you have 24, and then you have uh, 1 to the. Now, what is that? You have uh, a word. Uh, first, you, you have N equals 0, and then you have K equals 0, and then you have N indices, letters, and you are, so you have all the words that, and you put all these words in the lexicographic uh, order, like in a dictionary, in an alphabet. Say, so, well, what does that to do with time? Okay, time. Once we have this word, 
we use this to discretize time. Now, this is simply to write the integers in modulus k n, and then there is this small kappa here. And then there are all these fractions with n. Now, OK, let me say this. n, it counts the day. So we have, we have time, so it's discretized in our watch. So in our watch, we have, these are called hands in, in, in English. So here, I have a very elementary watch. I have only three hands. There is one that is counting the hours. There is another one that is counting the minutes. And there's the third one is counting the seconds, right? So this means that n, let us say, is the hours. I prefer to say the days. So let us think of n as first day, second day, third day. In each day, k are the hours, say 24. So we have day four, day four, first hour, second hour, third hour. And inside each hour, we have the seconds, milliseconds, milli, milliseconds, because actually here we have infinitely many hands. So forget the details. This seems that when we have that dictionary, we can use a word to say we are at day 125 at the time uh, 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 15. Uh, let us use it 24 hours, uh, uh, 15 uh, the, the points or zero, zero, and uh, the, these seconds and so on. So this is a very natural discretization of time, which is only interpreted here as a map from the dictionary into the, into the axis, the time axis. So the time axis is replaced by this grid. Okay. Space discretization, that is a bit more subtle. How we can use the same word by which, so the day 20, day 120, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, how we can use this to discretize space? Well, we can discretize space because we will give, and this you see is given sum. I will give an example later. Oh, how we do that here. So, is given sum map that given the word, so given that the same indices, which are there, will provide what? Will provide now a family of points, but in this case, in the space, not in the axis, but in R2, in, 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 in space. We have this grid, and this grid is this property that every day, so N is moving with the day. So every day, we add the new points to the grid. So the grid is not given at the beginning. The grid is growing day after day, is adding points, so it increases in n. And of course, in the end, we will have uh, countable grids in this space. And how every day we add points to that grid? We add points to that grid that if you take one word, and this plus means the word that is immediately following in the diction, in the, in the uh, lexicographic order, the distance of the two points becomes smaller and smaller. So we have a discretization of space, which increase day after day, is adding point, and these points are added closer and closer. So, because we want to discretize, we have to take close. So, Suppose that we have just this way of defining the, I will give an example later, but for the moment we only need these two properties, is increasing in n and is coming closer and closer. So this is the grid. But now we want to write an ODE. When we write an ODE, we have the right hand side. My ODE will be of order two. It's like F equal MA. So, the right hand side is the vector field that uh, uh, we have to integrate. So, okay. An ODE is to integrate a vector field, right? So I have to give a vector field. This vector field is assigned on this grid. And now we have points in space, points in time, in the cylinder. At each point, we attach a vector, right? So I call this kinetic because uh, there is no force actually here. Here, it is just the fact that given 
a, 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 a discrete space location and giving a, a discrete time, at that moment I see an arrow, I see a vector. And this is this vector uh, gamma. And this uh, vector is assigned actually uh, uh, at the beginning, not everywhere in the grid, but which was here. So the first step, we have to understand that when we have this grid that increases day after day, we have the notion of a local time. Because we put in a location, that location is not yet in the first day that this location has been added. Because remember, every day we add new points and we get this countable grid. So if I take a location, uh, this location maybe is still in the future, it's not visible, will come into the grid later on. But certainly since it is increasing the grid, there is a smallest n, so there's the first day that the location comes into the grid. But then in, in this map, maybe that same location will occur again and again at different times. So once this location is into the grid at the first initial time, it will, be, it will remain in the space-time grid also at certain later time. So I see it now, it's like Lagrangian and Euler, the point of view in mechanics. This now is for the Euler point of view. I sit in this location and I see that uh, this location in space-time will be the new location at a sequence of uh, uh, future time. These are the local time in which, at that point, the vector field will change. So the vector field is not given once forever at a location, space location. At that space location, the vector field changes in a sequence of time starting from an initial time. And then, given a point, P, given a point P, and given the time corresponding to the same word, that is the synchronization. The same word gives a time and gives a point. So in, in, in this, which is a subset of the parabolic cylinder, we assign the, a, a vector is a complex numbers. It's better to think of a complex numbers. So S is the domain is this subset of the space-time grids, and at each point there is this vector. Okay, this is, uh, looks complicated. Huh. Suppose that we have done that. This was the kinematics. Now comes the dynamics, so the forces, and that comes the equation of motion. So the equation of motion have a very familiar uh, uh, appearance. It's just a second order uh, initial value problem, a Cauchy initial value problems, and G now, since it is at the right hand side of the second derivative in time, this is the equivalent of F equal MA. So this G is uh, physically is the equivalent of a force. We touch a force. Geometrically, this is a curvature. So we assign a, a force in, in, in the space cylinder. There are these forces that appear from time to time at the locations. And of course, when the trajectory reaches that location at that time, find this force and change direction. We start from an initial state with an initial velocity. But this is defined only on the grid. We want to have an equation in which the vector field is defined everywhere in the space-time cylinder. Well, we just put zero outside. Now, if you think a little bit, so this is a simple second order ODE, Cauchy value problems, but the right hand side is essentially almost everywhere and almost uh, everywhere in space and almost uh, uh, every time, zero, absent. So if this is absent, the second derivative is zero, what this means, no force, we have the Galilean movement. We go straight ahead. So most of the time, this trajectory is going rectilinearly. There is no force, no change of uh, acceleration is zero. Only from time to time, in a special location, it finds a force which 
forces this trajectory to make an angle. So essentially, this is an ODE which describes zigzagging trajectories. Oh, this is quite different from what we are accustomed to work with. It's not a differentiable field. It's not tangent. Because either we go straight ahead or we make an angle. This is interesting. Technically speaking, this trajectory, a continuous function, the trajectory is a continuous vector valued function, right? We have, is, is a continuous function. The derivative as jumps from one day to another day, this n, n plus 1 is the day. Inside the day, we have the minutes, the seconds, and so on. So it's continuous, but as jumps. So the second derivative, which is the one that brings the g, is a measure. Is a measure. So these are measure valued in time, ODEs, and allowing for these measures, these delta measures, means that we are getting away from C1 trajectories and we are accepting zigzagging. Incidentally, in the theory of movement of curves by curvature, is a very big, important theory. If you look, there's an assumption that essentially says that certain C1 estimate hold uniformly. So essentially, that theory exactly says, however this motion of this curve is going on, it still keeps a tangent. Otherwise, we cannot write the differential equations. But exactly this bound that is in the usual motion of curves by curvature is that C1 bound that prevents what is happening here, prevents the sharp change from here. And this is what makes the object that I will show you in a moment invisible in the classical theory because we impose since the beginning that we want to have derivatives. So this is this first example. We don't impose that. We accept this. Sometimes drunken people go that way, right? They go and suddenly. So it is a sort of drunken, the path of a drunken person. OK, what we can do? We can choose. We have to choose the initial state, the initial velocity, and then we have to construct the grid. We will use, say, we, we take a polygon, a polygon. We take the initial state to be a side of the polygon. And the initial velocity, for the moment, we take one of the side. So we start from the vertex of a polygon. And initially, we impose that we move along one of the side that comes out from that point. The grid is so chosen, the fact that there are the local times means that in this construction, the trajectory returns to that x every day at midnight, like Cinderella. So this trajectory actually are cycles. It's so constructed that during the day, this drunken trajectory goes where it wants to go. But at midnight, it has to come back at this vertex, at x. So we have cycles. But every day is a new cycle. OK. The construction of the grid and of the vector field depends on a parameter. Actually, it's an homotopy class here. So there is a parameter. And you construct this by using something different, which includes the Euclidean situation. You use contractive similarities. Similarities means that uh, you just uh, 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 change the, uh, you respect the angles, you, you change the, the size, the, 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 the length, <coughs> and contractive. And uh, you use certain symmetry, which are attached to the polygon. I will not give you. You can give explicit equations for the similarities, for the symmetries. So you, you must have these transformations. These are two groups. You have to have two groups of transformations. The interesting fact is 
that you can choose, so that exists, you, you, you write down this transformation in such a way that this orbit, Cinderella orbits, have this property. The property is, for every beta, I have one equation. Then beta is changing from one to two. The orbits and everything depends on this beta. Now, if beta is one, remember, we have a polygon. Uh, let us think that this polygon is a square. So we start at the vertex of a square. So at the beginning, this beta is one. So the first ODE is moving this point every day, is moving along the perimeter of the square. Essentially, because the square, say, you divide it by two, by four, etc., etc. So it's moving discreetly, but always remaining on the perimeter of this case. And this is a single orbit in a day. At the end of the day, taking the limit in n, this orbit will essentially describe the perimeter. So what do we have? We have a trajectory that is simply describing a very uh, uh, simple a curve is the perimeter of a square. No interest in that. But as soon as we change beta between one and two, this drunken guy is not going straight ahead in, in, in his, in his, in his uh, square, in his perimeter of the square. He starts to move inside. Every day, it moves inside. It always comes back at the vertex. But every day, it moves inside the square. It moves inside, inside. So I have these orbits, which are zigzagging. This drunken path is now taking place inside the square. He said, OK. Well, it's interesting. Because although it is very zigzagging very crazily, it's a Jordan curve. A Jordan curve is a curve which has one side and the other side. So a Jordan curve is an interface. So suddenly, with beta bigger than one, the boundary of the square becomes an interface inside the square between what is inside, what is outside. Oh, that is interesting, because there can be an exchange of information between what is inside and what is outside. So the external boundary of the square starts to become an interface inside. And this is homeomorphic. Oh, this is also good because we can transport. When we have an homeomorphism, what we do on the boundary, we can do inside on these interfaces. And what happens day after day in the end? Hey, in the end, it happens that this curse, which is inside, is now filling something which is a continuous object, which is a limit. In the house of metric of sets, there is this limit, beta. And this is a fractal Jordan curve. So we have this interface, but this is a fractal interface and has a Hausdorff dimension. And this Hausdorff dimension is something that increases from 1 to 2. So allowing this drunken trajectory to move by angles and not by tangents, this orbit becomes greater, fat, fatter and fatter. In the end, it fills a set which has infinite perimeter. Because if it has dimension bigger, the perimeters are, uh, but we know dimensionally in, in the plane, they have dimension one, n minus one, dimension one. This is not, this has even dimension two. And what happens if we have bit equal two? If we have bit equal to, in the end, this perimeter is mapped, no more homeomorphic, cannot be, but is mapped as a continuous map with the full surface of the square. So we have that uh, the trajectory becomes two-dimensional, becomes the square. This goes back to this filling space curves of Hilbert and so other. So the limit attractor is now a, a, a two-dimensional domain, and we are talking about the square. So the attractor now, which is the limit of the orbits in the end, is the full square. So essentially, we have constructed an ODE, which has orbits, but in the end, with beta going to two, 
the limit of the orbits is the full square. Oh, this is an extraordinary object. We have went across the dimension. Now, what is what we learn from this? The first thing is that in order to go to transcend, to go behind perimeters, to achieve this uh, uh, increase of dimension, we have to use curvature field, which are supported in this uh, uh, grids. And essentially, these are induced by a finite changes of angles, but these vectors return. So essentially, since we are doing angles, but since we have to return to the same point, if we turn to the left, sometimes we have to turn to the right. So if the curvature, if we take the sine of the angles, the, 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 the total uh, with sine, the, the, the curvature is zero. But without the angles, it, it, it grows up to infinity. So this is uh, an unusual way of moving curves by curvature. The second thing that we learn is that in the, multiple, in, in the final case, we have multiple points. This is the case when we fill. But just taking the parameter bit a little bit less than, we resolve the singularities. The multiple points disappear. Because as soon as we get beta less than one, we get this homeomorphic curves to the boundary. This is very interesting. We have a way to approximate a surface, the surface of the square, with a curve, just taking a parameter a little bit less than two. You know that resolving singularities is a big problem in algebraic geometry and so on. Here is a much simpler situation. But it's very nice to see that essentially we have this homotopy that uh, 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 for parameters less than two is. The third property is when we have the homeomorphisms of the boundary into a region, we can transport many things. We have had this wonderful talk yet yesterday about transporting measures. Can transport. We have, we have essentially a dynamical system in the phase space here. But not only we can transport uh, 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 measures, we can transport energies. We can transport the functionals, so we can transport the Laplacian. So we have a sort of interpolation between the one-dimensional Laplacian with the two-dimensional Laplacian. This is also interesting to see that the one-dimensional dynamics, which is very simple, ahead and behind, ahead and behind, can be, in an homotopy sense, related to the cross two dimensional to the Laplace, where the dynamics is not behind and in front, but is north, south, east, west. So we get more complicated dynamics. Incidentally, I don't know if Stefano Mortele is around. I finish. As I would say, I will not touch the second part. Uh, uh, the, the, this fractal Laplace, it seems, but I never heard from him, that De Giorgi had this idea of defining the Laplace operator on, on, on strange sets, on fractal sets. And he said, you take uh, a neighborhood of this, you take the, and then you shrink, etc. It, it doesn't work very much that way, but I never heard this conjecture. So if somebody heard, uh, the Georgi talk about this conjecture, how to define the Laplace operator on a crazy set. Please let me say what was. And then just this is, which I will not go into the details. The second example is that you define uh, a dissipative system. So essentially, I will tell this in words. You have infinite many particles that is an avalanche, is a sun pie. A sand pie. You have a pie of sand, and this sand from the top starts to collapse. It's an avalanche model. This was done by physicists in automata theory, cellular automata. These are finite particles. And the characteristic of this uh, system is that the particles become fragmented, smaller and smaller, and they interact at shorter and shorter distance and more frequently in time. Again, if you use here the synchronization of space and time, you can produce a completely discrete, so here there is a little bit of literature, but then you produce a model, I will not go into details, which is an impulsive model coupling uh, certain equations that bridges the gap between the automata models, so the finitely many particles, to the limit, 
which is a, in this case is a PD because it's the regular thing. Let me just perhaps, if just I abuse of one second, probably I hope want to remain in my time, uh, because the last comment is for Louis. If you look, what is behind that? You will un you, you, it seems that when we have reached some regularity, we reach some conclusion that we want, it is because underlying this, there is some special greed. In the case of the uh, regularity of weak solution in elliptic, uh, we, everybody of us know the Nuremberg translation methods. The Nuremberg translation methods is that instead of working directly with the derivatives, you work with the finite uh, quotient, differential quotient. So he has to use the regular square grids to understand that. And what are the grids in the other theory? In the other theory, in, in, in the, when you get fractals, you have to use grids which are invariant under similarity, which is another group, not the translation, but the similarity. And more interesting, and this is, as you see, the end, that general theory, which I'm not talking about, has to do with abstract harmonic analysis, to do with uh, quasi-metrics, which are elder distance, and in, in that theory, there are coverings. People in working in Calderon, Zygmunt, uh, singular and integral, etc. know these coverings. Now, these coverings, the center of these coverings, are the grids. And there is an invariant under the homogeneous structure of the space. So the message is, if we go at the very, very roots, we find grids. And it's the invariants of these grids that, at the surface, produce the beautiful object that we all know. I hope that I didn't abuse all my time. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much for your question. You are perfectly in time. You have time for comments or questions. Is there? Not so come si chiude questa cosa. Not about uh, oh. exactly the talk, but in general, just a curiosity. Uh, in the last slide, number six, seven, uh, you wrote a limit um, in the Hausdorff matrix and so on. In some uh, special easy cases, there is a connection uh, between uh, convergence in the Hausdorff matrix and the Moscow convergence. OK, the, the, this is the, 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 the no, no. The, 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 OK. Well, I, I, I will answer this question because it reminds me of what the Georgi was saying yesterday with all respect for his. He was talking about the Pythagorean theorem as one of uh, standing ideas, referring to Hilbert. Now, what is Pythagorean is, we know what Pythagorean is. Uh, what is, uh, 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 wh why it has to do with convergence? Uh, in Hilbert, if you have the convergence of a subspace, you expect that the orthogonal subspace also converges. But the fact that if a subspace converges, the orthogonal also converges, so the fact that Pythagoras theorem remains invariant requires mixing weak and strong topology. Because when we go to the dual of the strong, we get the weak. Now, in that convergence, which he mentioned, exactly at the very beginning, you use both weak and strong in the two limb infant. The fact that you use both makes this convergence invariant, makes this convergence respecting, is, is, is a Pythagoras theorem stable convergence. And when you have this Pythagoras stability, and you apply this to the spectral subspace, the spectral subspace converge, but the orthogonal, which is where the other eigenfunctions come, so also will converge. And then you have the spectral. So essentially, that convergence is the convergence of the spectra. In fact, this was named between Scylla and Charybdis. Incidentally, Scylla and Charybdis brings us again to the George, because he mentioned that he was in Messina. Scylla and Charybdis, for those that uh, well, don't know, maybe the northern people that come from Lake of Como, is the strait <laughs> between Calabria and Sicily, in which there are these two monster stones, etc. And essentially, uh, going through this strait means to avoid 
rocks and wheels means to keep the spectrum and not to get the, the, the boat can be fragmented geometry goes to pot but you will survive with the spectrum <laughs> sorry Thank, was not prepared that this question <laughs> I have seen <laughs> Thank. Okay. Thank you is there any other question or comment if not, we thank again. Thank you. Thank you.